Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi. What a great privilege it is to join you again, to relax and hear a story of how the Holy Spirit touched someone's heart, to bring them to a deeper walk with Christ, and then to discover the church. And, uh, you know, so many of my, especially if you've been watching the program for years, so many of my guests, uh, it was their walk with Christ that came first, and then later they discovered the church. Some were the other way around. Sometimes it's the exact same time. But what to me that emphasizes that Lord works with us all in different ways. But I do believe that when you hear the stories of our guests, especially those of you who regularly pray for those that are outside a walk with Christ or outside the church and praying for them, when you hear the stories, it gives you a hint on how the Holy Spirit touches someone's lives, and maybe that's the way that you can pray for those in your life, especially during this difficult time that we're living, when, for whatever reason, we've been separated from one another. So it's good to have you join us on this program tonight. Our guest tonight is a former Wesleyan. He's the president of Quincy University of Illinois, which just happens to be a Catholic university, a Franciscan university, Dr. Brian McGee. It's a pleasure to meet you, and it's a pleasure to be here. Dr. McGee, it's great to have you here. Uh, boy, I'd like to answer you all kinds of questions, especially what's it like to be the president of a university during this COVID crisis. Oh, that, we could fill hours on that one. I spent a lot of my waking hours just thinking about COVID-19, unfortunately. Yeah, when you went to school to study how to be a president of university and you mm -hmm. took president of university 101, <laughs> did it have pandemic? I promise you it didn't. <laughs> Though, yeah, I went to school to become an academic and a professor and the, the presidency just came years later, but uh, certainly Certainly, I never dreamed I'd need to become an amateur epidemiologist. None of us did. Even just a year ago, none of us saw this coming. But anyway, we'll put that aside. Fine. Let me back off. I'd love to invite you to start us on the journey. Let's go way back and let's hear how the Lord touched you huh? in your life. Well, Mark, I think a lot of people assume that a Catholic university president is somebody who was a cradle Catholic, grew up in the <laughs> church, had a very um, straightforward path through Catholic schools all the way to university and never left. And that is not my story. <laughs> Um, you know, my family's from Illinois. I I've, I've largely grew up in Indiana, and um, my parents were uh, largely unchurched people. They, um, yeah, their, their families were nominally Christian, but um, they had not been regular churchgoers growing up through childhood. Did you, I don't mean to interrupt, did you ever think of how that happened? Oh, that's a lot. You long, know what I mean? How, yeah. It, it always amazes me when I think... Mm -hmm how someone, the family, just didn't get touched. Well, yeah, yeah I mean, there are some sto family stories about that. So my, my, my great-grandparents were faithful Catholics, good Irish Catholics that live in Peoria, Illinois. And <laughs> the family story is that their older children very much grew up in the church, but that they had so many children that the family got tired of, uh, 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 yeah, of of uh, religious instruction, and that the younger Houlihans were sort of wild children left to fend for themselves. And my grandfather married a Unitarian, and um, there, there just wasn't much uh, religious practice uh, in the home for my mother. And my parents, in turn, um, <clears throat> did not have much of a faith at all. So. Okay. There was a time when I was about five years old when a babysitter decided that the, the McGee boys were going to grow up wild and, and pagan if they didn't do something about that. So they asked my parents for permission to take us to church every Sunday. And my parents said, great, please get them out of the house for a few hours. <laughs> so uh, I wound up growing up in the Wesleyan church. I was in a tiny little rural Indiana church, uh, just about 100 people attending church every day, every Sunday. Mm -hmm. And it didn't really take for my brother, um, but for me, it was uh, Sunday mornings, many Sunday evenings, some church meetings on Wednesday nights. And you know, I, I wound up um, teaching myself at times, but also going through Sunday school. And um, you know, by the time I was 16, I was a full member of the Wesleyan Church. I was a voting member. I was elected treasurer of, of the church. And so... I, it, you know, it was very much uh, a daily part of my everyday life to be in that evangelical Christian tradition. Okay. The, um, I know you've heard this analogy that, uh, that people say that sometimes the, the longest step, <clears throat> the longest distance is from here to here, mm -hmm. from head to heart. Right. You know, in terms of our faith. Uh, as you look back on those days, you know, it's not like you really got a lot upstairs as you were understanding your Wesleyanism, you're very involved. Had it gotten down to the heart as a young man, you think? Oh, I, I think so, very much so. I had the, the born-again experience when I was 13. Of course, um, 
you know, the Wesleyan Church is one of those um, traditions that is in the holiness, was in the holiness right. movement. Um, and boy, feel intimidated even talking about Protestant traditions with you, given yeah. your, you oh. know, your great skill in history. But, um, you know, we had the notion of being born again yep. and then the second act of grace of sanctification. So I, I felt very much at home in that tradition. I didn't really know any other tradition. Uh, I knew some of the history of the Wesleyan Church in the act of becoming a member. I knew that there'd, there'd been a series of mergers um, that culminated in the merger with the Pilgrim Holiness Church in 1968. Right. So the Wesleyan Methodist Church and the Pilgrim Holiness Church became the Wesleyan Church. And I knew the relationship to Methodism wasn't particularly strong in some ways uh, <laughs> by that point. But um, I mean, Catholicism, for example, was alien. Um, I couldn't have found a Catholic parish if I'd tried. There weren't very many Catholics in that part of Indiana. I only knew two Catholic families and those not well. Um, there was a little indifference, but also a little hostility so to, yeah. to the Catholic Church. Um, the one person I knew who had grown up Catholic, had converted to, to Wesleyanism, was um, attending what's now Indiana Wesleyan University and was, and was considering the ministry. And he was pretty hostile to his childhood tradition. Okay. So... I got to hear that while the 66 books were just fine, uh, those extra Catholic books were, were, were dangerous or even heretical. Um, and there was a sense that there was a lot of suspicion of papal supremacy. There was, a, there was just a, a lot of uncertainty about this tradition. I remember a, uh, a Sunday school teacher and, a, and a, a dear family friend who in a generous moment said, you know, he thought, he thought about it a lot. And he'd come to the conclusion there would be Catholics in heaven. And this was, I think, a significant admission for him and an act of Christian grace. <laughs> um, <clears throat> as you look back um, to your Wesleyan upbringing, it's kind of amazing that some of these groups, like the holiness movements, had no clue how close to becoming Catholic they were. <laughs> you know what I mean? And some, some of their theology. Well, it took me years to come to that recognition uh, because I had, you know, I had this sense that there could be nothing more further afield from uh, an, an evangelical tradition than uh, the Roman Catholic Church. And it was only years later as I, as I went to RCIA and I read out and I read voraciously as I thought about becoming a Catholic that I came to the recognition that the differences we were fighting about were I mean, quite antithetical to um, to Christian solidarity and to unity, and that we were we were we were trying to figure out how many angels were dancing on the head of a pin, while um, we were failing to preach the gospel, we were failing to to be an authentic Christian witness, yeah. and I, I found that uh, I mean, very uh, a big revelation for me in my twenties. Yeah, one of the things we do in the Coming Home Network, I think I've mentioned this on the program, is that. Uh, uh, Monsignor Jeffrey Steenson and I every week do a, a podcast. We're studying through Irenaeus' Against Heresies. Mm -hmm. wow. And it's just, a, it's a book, it's mm -hmm. a big book, but right. it's just one of the most important books in the history of Christianity, I think. Mm -hmm. But what cracks me up is that he warned in there, guys, don't go beyond what God's revealed. Don't get caught up in the arguments over words. You know, we, we get caught up in the stuff that if God wanted us to know, he told us, stay there. Well, we in the church... Got caught up in that. Oh, we did not take that wise counsel. If we did, there'd been so less divisions mm -hmm. if we'd have held to charity well, in that. And it's heartbreaking for those of us who've, and I think it moves the other way. I've known, I have dear friends who've moved from the Catholic Church to the Orthodox Church or the Catholic Church to the, to yeah. the Anglican tradition. And while I love my church and my faith, uh, I recognize the, the, the wonderful and good work done by Christians. Um, uh, of yeah. every imaginable tradition worldwide. And it's heartbreaking that we find ourselves arguing about our differences when we can find so much common cause to do the work uh, of the church and to do the, the work God calls us to. Yeah. And, and like I said, that some of these non-Catholic Christian groups who were breakaways from a breakaway through reading of scripture, they don't realize how much they become Catholic in the process with their commitment to holiness mm -hmm. and simplicity detachment. I mean, that's mm -hmm. Catholic. Couldn't agree more. <laughs> um, but for me, I mean, I had this wonderful journey through high school and as a, as a Wesleyan. I went to college. I found a Wesleyan church to attend. But 
I had always had in my reading uh, a bit of curiosity about Catholics then. And, you know, in university, you meet people yeah. of all stripes and traditions. So I started to meet more people who were Catholics, some of them joyously so, some of them in open rebellion against their childhood faith. <laughs> um, but uh, I had the first exposure and a curiosity that led ultimately to say, all right, as I finished my bachelor's degree, I, I was dating a woman who was Catholic. I, I went to no, Mass. No, that would open up the can of worms. It, it would, <laughs> but I think I was going there anyway, Marcus. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it, it was a, an entry. Um, and I went to my first Mass um, and St. Agnes Cathedral in Springfield, Missouri. And um, boy, that was an experience. I, I received no advance prep. And of course, uh, there is, uh, in churches that don't have a strong liturgical tradition, um, the notion of, of responses to Mass, uh, the notion of uh, the, you know, the, the great consistency we have from parish to parish, from, uh, from national church to national church, is a wonderful strength of Catholicism. But for somebody who is used to very little structure other than music and sermon, uh, it was quite a shock for me. Um, and then we went. Then came the moments to go to um, to go you know, to receive uh, from the Lord's table. And of course, I'd gone to communion before. I you know I'd, I'd received uh, I'd received um, I'd received communion, but I didn't quite know what was going on here and whether I was supposed to go up or not. So I had all these terrified moments. The first experience of Mass. Our guest is Dr. Brian McGee. Well, hopefully they didn't put you in the front row when you visited the mass. Oh, then you I, can't leave anybody to watch. You know? Oh, I, I was in the second row. So I had all the... So I. So do I sit? Do I stand? What do I do? Uh, and so the... Uh, the you mean, I, the woman who'd taken me had great fun with me afterwards because, of course, she was a cradle Catholic. And so all this was second nature to her. I'm sure my church tradition would have been quite alien. Did the... You know, the awkwardness and the confusion of that, was it a, yet through that, were you drawn at all to it? Or? Oh, very much so. I mean, the, um, I mean, this, this sense, uh, there was this overpowering sense of continuity, of mm. tradition, of, of having a way to, uh, to approach the Lord that was very different yeah. than what I'd experienced, but it was also very invitational for me. I can imagine someone else being scared off. Um, but for me, it was, it was something to understand. And, and so that, that was intellectually exciting, as well as, um, I think, very much calling to my heart, as well as my head. I was just thinking, as you were saying that, um, it, 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 it would never cross our minds to, to not expect that if I, had, if I came to Quincy University and I had an appointment to meet with you, mm -hmm. president of the university, and I'd say, what do I do? Right. I don't just walk into his office. There's probably a procedure. Now, you, you raise that from a president of the university to mm -hmm. the president of the United States. I don't just walk into his office. There's got to be a way. Exactly. Well, that's liturgy. It is. And uh, liturgy is also powerfully instructive. It, um, it means so much about the structure of the Mass not only leads us to Jesus directly, but it also gives us instruction along the way. And so the structure of the Mass over the course of weeks, months, years leads us to Scripture in a comprehensive way. Uh, it yeah. gives us a sense of sort of the teaching authority of the Church. It gives us a sense of the role of dogma and tradition. I mean, everything we need to know about Catholicism is bound up in the Mass. And I can't tell a 10-year-old of that. Uh, I have to explain <laughs> it after the fact. But, um, I mean, uh, this all I now appreciate. But uh, that first experience was... Yeah, you um, didn't become Catholic the next day. Oh, well, we, we make sure that can't happen as Catholics. Um, I mean, the, yeah, I mean you, you enroll in RCIA, you take classes, and I had this fascinating experience. I'm at this point at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale, Illinois. I'm at the Newman Center. I just, so you had really, after that, kind of made a movement towards it. Oh, absolutely. I'd made this decision that I was not going to tell anyone I was doing this. I didn't want to deal with my family. I didn't want to... I didn't want to have to explain myself to friends. This was literally a, I'm going to enroll in RCIA and I'm going to go to one class. And if I like it, I'm going to go to the second one. <laughs> and if I don't like it, uh, they'll never see me again. But uh, from my perspective, it was one week at a time. Is the Holy Spirit mm. going to lead me to the next week? Uh, is this going to be the right experience for me? I knew I was attracted um, spiritually. I was attracted uh, intellectually. 
I was fascinated by the sense of history and tradition in the mm. sense that this church was the first church and in many respects we understand as the church and I wanted to figure that out mm. and I didn't know if that was going to lead me to be a Catholic or not but I was going to keep showing up and I had these two wonderfully and very different priests and a sister and I'd never met a nun in my life uh, so that was that was its own moment that was its own sort of revelatory moment for me but every week I was more curious than the week before would, as you look back was it a good at the Newman Center is that where you were going was it a good Newman Center and good experience it was a good experience um, you know I, I have a sense that at that particular RCIA we were trying to be so open and so welcoming that uh, it was a little content light at times mm -hmm. it was about the experience more than <clears throat> than the than the, the, the how rather than the why. And so I found myself giving myself a lot of extra reading assignments, okay. the sort of thing a master's student would do to himself. Okay. That's why I was wondering whether you were encountering some of the big issues that would have been barriers to or, or were they kind of kept to the side? Um, I think there was an assumption, and I think every RCIA experience is different because right. based on who leads it, that we were already firmly committed, we were going through the experience. Some of the folks who were there were very much there because they wanted to marry a Catholic and decided to enter the church primarily for that reason. Um, and so maybe the assumption was that people were already 99% there and that this was the last 1%. That was not true for me. As I said, it was one week at a time. And I kept being back there the next week. Um, what was the first um, did you encounter any major barriers that made you back up a bit in the process? Well, I, I think for, for many of us who, who come from the sort of the Protestant side of the house, yeah. there's the question, I mean, what, what is it about the saints that we need to okay. understand? And of course, well, how does, why is Mary so sort of differently understood and foregrounded compared to so many other traditions? I mean, I, for years as a scholar, I studied the Ku Klux Klan, which was... Uh, not only virulently anti-black and anti-Jewish, but also anti-Catholic yeah. for almost all of its tradition, powerfully so. Yeah. Those of us who are members of the Knights of Columbus know that the, the Knights of Columbus tangled rather directly with the, the mm -hmm. Knights of the Ku Klux Klan in some places. But, I mean, the Ku Klux Klan often talked about Mariolatry and accused Catholics of being people who worshipped Mary. And so, you know, there's this moment where there's this long discussion of the, of the saints and how, no, we do not worship saints. Uh, we believe that the saints can intercede for us and that they, uh, and that just as every Christian tradition teaches that the death is not a, a final and that there is life, uh, there is life in the church and life in Christ Jesus, that um, the saints can be intercessors for us in the same way that Mary can intercede for us. And so that was uh, very important to okay. me because there was a, this innate suspicion that somehow Catholicism had taken this massive wrong turn centuries earlier and with an inappropriate devotion to Mary. And I came to a quite different conclusion that Mary is the great, one of the great strengths of the Catholic tradition. It's kind of amazing when you think about that one doctrine. Mm -hmm. Communion of the saints, ask of the intercession is such an important part that <clears throat> when you enter mass if you don't if you're not there yet with that there's so much around you that doesn't connect right but once you you understand that that all of a sudden mm -hmm. so much in the sanctuary so much right. in the mass opens up well if you walk into the quincy university chapel and i'm pleased to report my president's office is closer to the chapel than it is to the men's bathroom <laughs> so i am always close to god um <laughs> That in that chapel, as wonderfully imagined over uh, over 70 years ago, we have um, the Franciscan saints. Uh, we have um, we have some who who have been beatified in the church. So, from from Scotus to Bonaventure to so many other Franciscans who have been part of leading people to Christ for generations. Um, we 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 have this wonderful story uh, you know, of Christianity told through the particular prism of the Franciscan tradition. But a, what a powerful way to, to explain yeah. how uh, the constancy of the church and the constancy of Christian teaching through the centuries. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, there are so many Catholic churches that in different ways speak to um, that continuity, knowing that um, nations rise and fall, but the church prevails. The, um, any thing you would have learned about the necessity of holiness and all of that would have connected with you from your past? Oh, absolutely. Of course, um, the notion that um, we come to, yeah, 
from my Wesleyan tradition, we, we come to, to Christ through the born-again experience. He must be born again. Um, but that there is uh, a, a second working of grace through sanctification that speaks in so many ways to the ongoing journey that a Catholic yep. is supposed to undertake, to our understanding uh, of our human faults and failings, the necessity for the sacrament of reconciliation um, uh, as a way of keep you know, coming back to God, of recognizing our sinful nature, of returning to, uh, of returning to closer and, more, and fuller communion with Christ. Um, those spoke to me once I untangled everything I'd heard that was allegedly wrong about, uh, about confession. And of course, my entire understanding of confession was watching television shows because I'd never had a conversation with a practicing and faithful Catholic about confession, let alone a priest. And so to understand why it is that we have confession and why it is important to our faith, um, that was, I think, also a concern I had as a, as a seeker. Uh, that was so wonderfully answered through the RCIA experience, through conversations with priests and religious. It also strikes my mind that someone from your background might see the need for us Catholics to take confirmation more seriously. I think that's a, that's a great challenge to us. Um, I mean, there's a sense, well, let's just back up. You know, one of the things I heard early in my, in my, in my seeking from the mother of a friend was that you can't really become Catholic. You're born Catholic. And so those of us who, who come to the church through RCAIA are okay, but we're, we're, we're a bit of a children. We're, we're children of a lesser God. I mean, <laughs> maybe our children can be legitimate Catholics. And I think that's from the sense that being Catholic is being part of a culture and not more than a faith. And obviously, I'm going to push back against that. Um, because uh, to be Catholic is to, is to practice. Uh, mm -hmm. It is yeah. to understand this is a journey with God and, uh, and that um, faithful uh, adherence to the faith is what makes one Catholic, not having been born in a particular way or baptized or confirmed at a particular moment. And I do th sometimes think that for Catholics, confirmation is sort of a moment on a calendar. It's a box that gets checked. Yeah. It's something you do because your other Catholic friends are having their children do it. And so... Um, I mean, for me, I think perhaps not as successfully as I would have liked. I try to give my own children the sense that this is why confirmation is special. When I think about the adult born again experience I had also, mm -hmm. that <clears throat> in a way I wish confirmation was that for so many Catholics. In other words, they had an awakening. Right. Now I understand what that baptism means. Mm -hmm. Now I understand what it requires of me. Now I need to surrender. Now I need that power of the Spirit. Now I need to be a witness. I, I couldn't agree more, and, then, and I know in some dioceses, people are a little, children are a little older when they have the confirmation experience, and I, I really think that's a wonderful idea. I, I'm not second-guessing the teaching authority of any bishop, but um, to give people the opportunity to grow enough to understand the, the weight and significance of the experience is, I think, a good thing. Two other issues I'm wondering if they brought up in RCIA that you would have been confronted, one of which is the, the authority of this guy over there in Rome, but also the moral issues. Oh, absolutely. Um, <laughs> boy, uh, we could spend the rest of our time just on any, on any one of the topics you've hinted at here. Uh, but, I mean, the, the teaching authority of the Pope, I think we dealt with that in 15 minutes. Um, <laughs> yes, the study of the papacy could be a life, is a lifelong project, but understanding, um, you know, understanding that the, the Pope's authority is fundamentally biblical. It is, the clear pattern in, okay. uh, for it is set in the New Testament. We understand that, that leadership uh, has power and import for helping to, to make sure that, that the church remains unified uh, and knowing that however imperfectly we have achieved that, and boy, we have imperfectly <laughs> achieved that, uh, knowing that the, the pattern is there and, and is not uh, the invention of humankind. It is, it is fundamentally uh, a, a, godly, uh, a, a godly and fundamentally Christian idea grounded in the words of Christ himself. Um, and to understand that papal uh, infallibility is uh, incredibly rarely invoked, that it is, uh, it, it's a coda to the larger experience of the church, um, was, I think, very comforting to me. Yeah. I mean, ultimately, the papal infallibility still points to the Holy Spirit. And uh, it, it always does. Uh, Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Uh, but to have, heard, from my childhood instruction, you would have concluded that um, the papacy was um, uh, 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 
you know, sort of a religious dictatorship, uh, and that there was no space for theological disagreement or for thoughtful deliberation uh, or for 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 um, you know for for loving instruction of the faithful that recognizes different ideas about scripture and about uh, Christian life. And then that other issue, which again, I, I mentioned that you would have, I'm sure, countered in RCA mm -hmm. is the thing that in our lifetime, when we have Humana Vitae and we have mm -hmm. a Pope yeah. who says, no, this is it, right. without all the pressure to change the idea of abortion and, and contraception and euthanasia mm -hmm. and all these major issues. I'm not sure how different that was from where you were coming into it from. Uh, you know, uh, I think so many of those social issues for evangelicals don't represent a, a big break from their own tradition. I yeah. mean, and we know that evangelical Christians... And praise God for that, yeah. that we're, we're brothers and sisters on those issues so uh, often. On, and it, it took a long time to recognize, I think. But um, I mean, I think evangelicals and Catholics have increasingly recognized that they have common cause uh, on life issues. I think we're, we're not entirely in alignment in some important ways in the entire fabric of life, but uh, on abortion, there's alignment. Uh, and and yeah. that has been good for, um, you know, for, for Christian common cause. Um, as far as, um, yeah, yeah, as far as teaching on birth control, for example, I mean, that, that one was less familiar. And, yeah. um, you know, this, my tradition had barely spoken to it at all, other than in the context yeah. of, um, the call to godliness and the call to um, the call to um, to fidelity in marriage, but um, that teaching was rich and powerful and cons and wonderfully consistent, and that was what I really found exciting about church teaching on life, that there was a, a unity and a consistency to that tradition that not only was powerfully aligned with uh, with Old and New Testament, but also. Um, made sense for me of what I saw as an inconsistency in the American political parties of, of my 20s or yeah. of my 50s, for that matter, yeah. that we have, that um, I don't find alignment with a political party in the United States because uh, Roman Catholicism is not neatly aligned with either political party. They don't have it right for us as Catholics. Yeah. And if you're comfortable with a political party as a Catholic, um, then you, you probably need to think a little more because neither of them is where we want to be. Yeah, yeah. And given the fact that we're in a sinful world, it probably never will exactly be there. But um, well, so what do we do? I mean, it's right. a tough thing. Mm -hmm. And so that's why we prayerfully ask God to guide our conscience and um, form our it, conscience. It, and then, and, and the bishops have been clear. We, we're still called yeah. to engage as citizens. We have an obligation to vote. I think the bishops do a great job of explaining that uh, we do not leave the world behind by becoming by becoming Catholic Christians. But um, to go back to the RCIA experience, I mean, I, th I think we, uh, you know, it's interesting. I think the, the folks who led my RCIA experience were a little scared of those social issues. They were so, I mean, whatever you want to call them, the social issues, the bedroom issues, um, they had, it's, it's so common for a lifelong Catholic to feel beaten up with those discussions that they want to avoid them if they can. And that was a shame because they're an important part of our Christian and Catholic tradition. And we need, yeah. and we need to understand what the church teaches about them. Yeah, if you get caught up in, I want them to love me. Right. Then pretty soon that the devil whispers in your ear, well, if you don't tell them this stuff then, mm -hmm. if you want them to love you, then don't go here. Well, and that's tough. Yeah. Uh, I know you've spent a lifetime preaching and teaching. I, of course, am a lifelong faculty member. And I know that uh, any good teacher eventually realizes everyone will not love you, uh, that there will be hard things you need to say to people, and no, no one more so than someone who preaches the gospel. Yeah. Um, you know, wonderful, um, wonderful um, 18th century Scottish rhetorician named Campbell teaching very Protestant future ministers. Um, talked about the fact that the very hardest um, kind of speaking in public is preaching the gospel. You've got a bunch of people who don't want to hear it, who might be out, outwardly hostile to it, who can walk away any time, uh, and who, if you teach the gospel authentically, will often be pretty unhappy with you. Uh, yet that is what we're called to do in Christian witness and certainly in Christian teaching. Yeah, I remember my homilex professor saying something like, if after the end of your sermon, everybody stands in line to congratulate you, it probably wasn't a good sermon. Uh, amen. <laughs> All right, let's take a break there. 
Dr. McGee, and we'll come back in just a moment. And before we break, I just want to remind you, if you go to chnetwork.org, that's the website for the Coming Home Network International, you'll find a lot of conversion stories and other resources to help you on your journey. We'll be with you in just a moment. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and our guest is Dr. Brian McGee, former Wesleyan president of Quincy University of Illinois. I'm looking forward to find out more about the university in a little bit. Sure. But uh, we ended with you encountering the uniquely Catholic mm -hmm. teachings in our CIA. It sounds like, as you said, they, they weren't necessarily jumping into all the big issues, but you were filling in the gaps on your own, mm -hmm. right? So did you, boom, you're, were you in? Well, I was, I realized at some point, maybe halfway through ICIA, that this was what I wanted, that this is what God was calling me to. And so there was no more conditionality of, well, I'm going to go this week and then see if I go the next week. I knew that this was my journey. I came into the church in the spring of 1990. I was a 22 year old. I had to explain to my confused family that I was becoming a Catholic. Um, you know, my parents were just as, um, just as indifferent, uh, they just, uh, I think their primary terror was that I was going to have 17 children because that was their <laughs> stereotype of Catholic families and that I would never complete my education and that my life would be ruined. But they, they were indifferent about what faith tradition I followed and, and my mother was aware of the fact there had been Catholics in her ancestry and the world had not come to an end. Um, <laughs> And of course, I, I, I should be fair to my parents. They have their own religious beliefs, and my, my mother is is churched at this point in her life. Um, but um, they still don't want to talk about religion because they, 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 they seem to still believe that it's a bit of bad form. It's impolite. They'll talk about politics all day, but not, but not religion. And then I had other friends who... Um, were either sort of secular and confused about why anyone would become a Catholic or were... Um, you know, were in one Protestant tradition or another and, and could not quite understand why someone was becoming Catholic. So I had to explain myself yeah. many times over. But uh, I came into the church that Easter um, and I, um, and now I've now spent more of my life as a Catholic than a non-Catholic and it has been a wonderful journey. I think about your particular journey then in education. Has it been your experience in your teaching and your studies to see that this kind of underlying anti-Catholicism is there as a part of our American tradition. Did you, you see, in other words, it's it's kind of hidden there because of, mm -hmm. of our New England English Elizabethan background. Yeah, you and I were talking earlier about both of us have family members who came, yep. ancestors who came to, to the United States or you know, or to right. Canada before those countries existed, uh, very much in a Puritan tradition for those early ancestors of mine. And yes, I think you can make a compelling case historically that our roots were profoundly Protestant, that there was deep suspicion of Catholicism and its political alliances in Europe, as well as of its religious, uh, of Catholic religious practice. And yet, the struggle of the first hundred years of this country was about fundamentally incorporating Catholicism and Catholics, not as an afterthought, not as cheap labor imported from Europe, but as uh, fundamental to the religious freedom of America. And you know, today, as has been the case for generations, the largest single uh, religious tradition in the United States continues to be Roman Catholicism. Yeah, I think John Bishop John Carroll's, one of his first goals was to help Catholics be Americans, mm -hmm. but to help help Americans understand that Catholics could be right. American. And, and there was a, a rear guard action fought against that. One of the reasons I was called earlier in my academic career to study the Ku Klux Klan was because of its um, powerfully anti-Catholic um, framework. And uh, I wanted to engage and understand that. And that was very much a struggle over who would get to be an American. Yeah. And yeah. today I think we're, we're full members of the club as Catholics, but it did not come easily. Yeah, there was there was a group called the Know Nothings, uh, while the anti-Catholic in the nineteenth century, as the uh, as the as the Klan was anti-Catholic in the twentieth. Yeah, yeah. Today, ironically, the Catholic tries to uh, the the Klan tries to recruit Catholics because they're looking for anyone they can call white to do that. And happily, most informed Catholics know better. 
Yeah, that anti-Catholicism can hide in a person's life for a long time. Mm. You know, you were sure. brought out of Wesleyan, you could have become Presbyterian or Lutheran, Episcopalian or mm. Baptist, no big deal, but Catholic, then it pops up. Oh, I sure. You look at my family <clears throat> history, it was Congregationalist, it was Presbyterian, it was Baptist, it was Unitarian, and you know, there was just a sense of easy flow from one church to another. And I think many of your listeners probably have family members who've moved from to multiple churches and multiple traditions over their lifetime. Um, that's not how Catholics approach the world normally. Uh, and you know, we, we make it harder to get in and we make it harder to get out, and I think for good reason. Yeah, yeah because we believe, as uh, the Vatican Council declared, that the fullness subsists here. Yeah. Um, amen. Yeah, yeah. Um, how did your... So there you were in college mm -hmm. when you came in. How did your, or did it, did your conversion to the Catholic faith uh, have an effect on your educational, your career, your, you know, and how you understood what now what you're supposed to do in your life? Yeah. It, at this point, I've finished a master's degree. I've spent my entire life in public higher education. And yeah, I taught at another public university, went to Ohio State, not far from your studios right. here to get a PhD. Um, went on to teach at another public university. And I had increasingly felt that um, it would be um, such a coming home for me, knowing the richness of the Catholic intellectual tradition and of Catholic universities in the United States. Um, it would be a wonderful experience for me to, to be in a Catholic university. And um, after several years of teaching at a Big 12 research university, I became the department chair of a communication department at Spalding University in Louisville, Kentucky, a wonderful a Catholic institution founded by the Sisters of Charity of Nazareth, this wonderful order focused on social work in, in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And um, I spent three wonderful years there immersed um, in what I found a rich and fulfilling um, Catholic tradition, even at a university with as many Baptist students as Catholics, uh, but with a mission to um, urban and suburban Louisville that was uh, that spoke to me and was profoundly um, satisfying and even a, a, sort of a cause of great joy for me. And so then I did something that in retrospect seems silly. I, uh, for, you know, I went to a public university for the next 15 years wow. and spent most of those 15 years wondering why in the world I'd done that. <laughs> uh, not that I didn't have a wonderful experience there with good people. And that led me ultimately to conclude that the next phase of my life, if as an academic leader, if that's what I was called to, was going to be in Catholic higher education. And that's where I, and that is how I came to be at Quincy University in Quincy, Illinois, one of the Franciscan universities in the U.S. and a wonderful place founded by uh, Franciscan friars in 1860. And and part of the settling of, of Illinois was the bringing of these German friars over to uh, yeah. over to Quincy. You know, a lot of those, I would guess, are non-Catholic viewers, when they mm -hmm. think of a Catholic university, they, they kind of just jump them all together in Catholic. But mm -hmm. the idea that it's Franciscan, mm -hmm. what would you say that that, why is an, an ordered mm -hmm. school, Dominican, right. you know, but or Jesuit, mm -hmm. but Franciscan, how it makes it unique in the way it approaches education? It's a great question. And, and to back up just a bit, one of the things anybody who comes into the church has to recognize is that in this wonderful two millennia tradition, we have had orders of uh, people of great faith organized around particular principles, serving um, you know, Christ in a particular way and the church in a particular way and bringing special gifts, what we call a charism. Um, and the Franciscans uh, very much organized around the, sort of the life, the teaching, and the influence of St. Francis of Assisi, a saint so famous that almost every Christian in the world has heard of him, um, one of the most famous uh, saints in all Christendom, and someone who is credited with uh, reviving the Christian church and witness in the 13th century. And for those of us who are from an evangelical tradition who understand what a, a, what a, what a revival is or what a tent meeting is, um, that was very much the 13th century equivalent. Um, Francis um, yeah, preached in the streets. He preached yeah. the gospel wherever he could find a willing witness. He lived a life of poverty and simplicity. Uh, and that great witness um, was um, the reason he became the reluctant founder of a, an entire tradition. And uh, I am not, I'm going to stop now when a man opens his Bible. Well, no, it goes right into what you're saying. Right. Because everybody in the world knows Francis. And they think about him and all that he'd done. Uh, 
And yet, if you were to pick a scripture, I had picked this out this morning as I was thinking about, if there's a scripture that is key to understanding Francis, it's, it's Luke 14, 33. So therefore, whoever of you does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. That's Francis. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not exactly a scripture that everybody in the world wants to follow. But no, that was Francis. Um, and St. Francis' example and his Christ-like nature was such a powerful witness to the people of, of Umbria and of Italy and ultimately of, of, of all of Europe and beyond, that today the Franciscans continue to be the largest amalgamation of orders in the world, and as they have been for centuries. Uh, and the, the recovery, the revival of Christianity um, yeah. is so directly attributable to Francis, which is to take nothing away from the other wonderful orders of the church. Um, but the, the men who continue to be uh, a witness to Christ's life in their Franciscan, uh, in their Franciscan tradition uh, are part of our life at Quincy University uh, and at many other Franciscan institutions. I know you've, you've been at one of those wonderful schools. Uh, and uh, it is, it is a, so, such a countercultural witness in a materialist world. Yeah, so often when I hear people talk about the history of the church, they want to be triumphalistic about it. and. You know, point out all. I tell my reading of history is that there were a great number of times in the history of the church when God was at the same point He was before the flood, mm -hmm. and so these people <laughs> are just going to do whatever they want to do. I've had it with them, mm -hmm. but it was in the Old Testament. It was the witness of a of a key person like a Noah, mm -hmm. or the intercession of Abraham, or Moses that kept God from saying, "I've had it." Mm -hmm. well, we wouldn't be here right. if it weren't for the prayers of of saints like St. Francis. And St. Francis was not an organizer. He didn't want to build a global order. He wanted to live a life of poverty and simplicity, and he repeatedly gave people every dime he had, the shirt off his back. Um, yeah, he had even in death to have, um, you know, to have a, a brother forbid him from, ta from, from taking his clothes off and giving them away as he lay dying. Um, that was the witness he wished to offer to us. And it's amazing that to follow a scripture like that, mm -hmm. that even within his lifetime, he had so many men commit their lives to following him. Which he so didn't want and <laughs> reluctantly accepted and um, created a profound um, influence on the life of the church to this day. And if you want to find direct material evidence of, uh, of the intervention of the Holy Spirit in the world, you can work to look, you can you know, look to the lives of the saints, and St. Francis is a prominent and wonderful example for me. And of course, the men who came after him who created an entire Franciscan intellectual tradition, which I know you've studied and I've tried to learn, and which um, informs all of Christian theology to this day, the work of, of Scotus, of Bonaventure, and of all those who followed in those medieval universities and kept Christianity alive and taught generations of preachers and teachers. Yeah, to me, that's a, a bit of a puzzlement is in some ways, for some people, a Franciscan university is almost an oxymoron. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. You, you know, so how do you, how does your Franciscan value shape the education at a university like yours? It's a great question because you're right. Uh, a tradition of itinerant preachers doesn't seem well suited to the brick and mortar of a university with residence halls and everything else. Yeah. And yet the answer is that um, we need a teaching framework to uh, yeah. help people understand and appreciate um, Christianity, uh, Catholic Christianity, and certainly the Franciscan tradition. And, th and that Franciscans the world over have found ways to rely on you know, on um, universities and on other modes of instruction they created to make sure they could send out people well qualified to preach and teach the gospel. Today, that means for us a powerful commitment to philosophy and theology for every student. That is not an experience I had at a public university, uh, and, but it is yet so powerful for us that, um, it, that our board of trustees would have to vote to change it. And that's just not the way universities work, let me be clear. <laughs> Faculty usually get to make those decisions, but that's essential to our nature and character. 
Secondly, the Franciscan tradition in, in particular speaks to um, a couple of unique attributes of Christianity. One is um, as mundane as the notion of hospitality, that we are that our arms are open wide to the world, uh, that we are not a, an elite club that one has to struggle to join. Uh, another notion, and perhaps a more fundamental one, is the notion uh, of, uh, of Christ becoming man to sacrifice himself for us um, as witness and model, becoming full, full, more fully human so that we can become more fully Christ-like. Mm -hmm. And that is a subtle but important difference from the, uh, from the tradition of Aquinas and Augustine that um, some of us learned and when we learned our Christianity or our New Testament in particular. Yeah, Francis and his followers were such models of sharing. Mm. In other words, the rich help the poor. Mm. You, you know, and everything I have is not mine. Right. You know, that was, and so to communicate that to young mm. men and women, hopefully, so that they become a witness to that in their lives, mm -hmm. to their children that have changed the world. Well, I mean, we could, we could wander far afield here, but we, you and I both know it is terribly difficult to live a Christian life mm -hmm. in, a, in a very material world mm -hmm. where the acquisition of stuff and money is so central to our lives. And there is nothing wrong with those things except when they get in the way mm -hmm. uh, of living a Christian life. And we know that... Um, there are many people who have loved Jesus and understood um, what the church brings to the world and to their own lives, who yet have found it very hard to live a Christian life in the midst of the rush for material possession. I mean, I'm guessing that at least in, in a Franciscan environment, you can, you can attack an issue that I can't imagine it being addressed anywhere else, and that is to help them understand the difference between needs and wants. Uh, amen. And that is, I think, one of the things that we get to challenge people uh, to consider at a Catholic university, and particularly at a, a Franciscan one, yeah. that was just completely absent from my public university experience. And there's nothing wrong with attending a public university. I had to get a great education. But the soul is not attended to yeah. in the way that the mind is in a place like that. And I believe that a Catholic university, if it's getting it right, is attending to to soul as well as to mind. Yeah, yeah. well, that's, that's awesome. Let me take an email. Uh, Dave from Canada writes, in the process of your conversion, what were some key things that helped convince you that the Catholic Church was not antagonistic towards intellectual pursuits, but instead emphasized both faith and reason? What a wonderful question. <laughs> and I think my answer is different than some of the other converts I've met over the years. Um, I began with the assumption that as I read that there was an intellectual tradition that was old and powerful, and everything I found early on confirmed that. Now I've met cradle Catholics who believe there was something anti-intellectual about the church, that it was authority-driven and that one, you know, you, if you attended to the bells and the smells and, and you did exactly what you were told, that you were not invited to, um, to integrate faith and reason. And that was not, never my experience of Catholicism. So I found it a wonderful intellectual awakening for me. Uh, Franciscan Bonaventure, I remember, I know I've mentioned it on the program, that in my own journey of Catholicism, a good friend had introduced me to a book by St. Bonaventure called Journey of the Mind to God. Right. And it's not an easy book. And uh, I'm just scratching the surface myself on it. Mm -hmm. But to me, one of the things that that Bonaventure hits in that is that where it seems that Thomas in his journey to God, St. Thomas of Aquinas, mm -hmm. his, his, his uh, trajectory is you start understanding mm -hmm. God and you eventually work yourself down to man, that Bonaventure seemed to take the other direction where he points out to us that we begin by looking for the evidence of God mm -hmm. in the world around us. And that seems to be a way it would shape education in a, in a Franciscan university. Well, and it's one of the <clears throat> fundamental challenges to yeah, the 18-year-old mind, if I may be so presumptuous, which is to say, um, if I can't touch it, see it, smell it, taste it, and you know, God is not physically present as a pillar of fire in front of me, so I'm openly skeptical of the existence of a God, or at least a God who matters to human life. And of course, Bonaventure's perspective 
would begin with all the evidence uh, yeah. uh, of God's work in the world uh, and of God's work uh, in places outside a church framework, uh, but in everyday existence. Uh, and it is in that humble uh, and, and, very, um, and very fundamental beginning that we begin to see the evidence of the existence of God and the work done in the world by the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I mean, so much of the early church emphasized that everything begins with the assumption of God as creator. Mm -hmm. If you miss that, you miss everything. Right. You know, it, it, human beings don't make sense. Right. In fact, the whole idea of the whole person, mm -hmm. I mean, at, at a Catholic university, do you find that an important part of teaching? Uh, absolutely, and it is that attendance to the, to the whole person that I think is fundamental to a Franciscan teaching philosophy and theology. Uh, and it is, uh, I think, one of the things that ought to characterize every, every Catholic university. And one of the things that I think is powerfully different for us as we attend to our students' needs in and out of the classroom, knowing that so much of their formation is spent in time with one another and in time away from the classroom. All right. Another email, Sarah from Washington, D.C. In your opinion, in what ways has the Catholic Church made contributions to Western civilization that we should better appreciate and be aware of? Oh, wow. In three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sarah, wonderful question, and the, and the answer I'm going to give is provocative. There is no Western tradition without, and no Western civilization without uh, Judeo-Christian tradition and with the Roman Catholic Church in, in particular. There are so many books that they chronicle century by century the ways in yeah. which uh, the Western civilization was advanced and in some ways saved by the Roman Catholic Church, which was a which was a source of continuity and a source of consistent learning over the course of centuries in a way that universities often weren't and that governments almost never were. So all I'll say is that's a great reading assignment. And if you want to take that class, come to Quincy University or to any good Catholic university and we'll help you out. Yeah, for those that, that just assume that the Dark Ages was a big time of ignorance, they, they don't, mm. they've never studied the 13th century. No, I mean, light and reason are not the product of, an, of a secular enlightenment. They are the product of, of the Roman Catholic Church. Let's say we've got somebody watching right now that is deep in their studies, they, but they've never taken the time to kind of examine the Catholic side of things. Mm -hmm. what, what would you say to them? Where would you encourage them to begin? I, it depends on the person, where they are in their faith journey, um, whether they have a great understanding of Christianity or not, or they're just coming to Christianity firsthand. But finding someone who can be a counselor and guide um, to talk them through the issues, I think, works for many people so much better than um, going into a corner and reading Wikipedia pages. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's a kind of person who comes to me to talk about Catholicism who's who's read a hundred books and spent a thousand hours, but most people aren't, aren't quite that far along. They're just trying to understand what the different boxes are and what their options are yeah. and to imagine what a faith journey might be for them. So find a trusted guide. And for so many people that has been walking into a library, but for even more walking into a church, finding a priest or a pastor or a sister and sitting down and having that conversation, knowing that people of good faith will help you. I find one of the most difficult questions I could ask is, what's a great book to read? Mm -hmm. well, where do you begin? Where mm -hmm. do you begin? So, and like you said, you got to know the person. And, mm -hmm. But for you, was there an author? C.S. Lewis, Mere Christianity, I think I was 13 years old. <laughs> um, and that particular work through my 13-year-old self was probably the first moment I realized there were other ways to be Christian than to be a Wesleyan. And that those ways were true and powerful and, and fundamentally uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit, no less than my own tradition. And so that one was wonderfully eye-opening. And it's good for someone who's unchurched or suspicious yeah. of Christianity, just as it is for somebody who's well in their own Christian walk. Yeah, yeah. And some might say, well, but that's, he's not Catholic. Well, but he does emphasize. Um, we, most of us, we're, we're in the hallway. Right. But you can't stay in the hallway. Mm -hmm. Right? In mm -hmm. that, you know, there, there's rooms. Yeah. Well, I, I picked intentionally a non-Christian author. Yep. But a few years later, for me, it was G.K. Chesterton. A, a, and someone who found his way to the Catholic Church and who I, and who I found as an intellectual guide. 
Well, it's a good thing you didn't go from C.S. Lewis to Woodhouse because then you'd just been a golfer. <laughs> but by Chesterton, <laughs> there you go. You know? <laughs> Well, the chapter on the paradoxes of Christianity was transformational for me and helped me make so much sense of the questions I was asking at that moment in my life. But oh, you have a wonderful and rich Catholic tradition. You can embrace uh, 2,000 years of church history and learn so much. Dr. McGee, what a great pleasure and privilege. Sir, it's been an honor being here, and thank you for your ministry and your apostolate. Well, and we're all, all our prayers with you as you... A difficult time as a president of a Catholic university. It is, but uh, it is rich and rewarding work, and I work, walk up, I work up, I wake up every morning joyous and happy and fulfilled. Thank you very much for joining us, and all of you. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Journey Home, and I pray that Dr. McGee's journey is an encouragement to you. God bless you. See you next week.